Good morning. Today is November 7th, and Josh Baker, myself, and along with Bryce Baldwin, will be interviewing Sylvester Puccio, a World War II veteran and Pearl Harbor veteran. You ready? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Uh, did you enlist, or were you drafted? Yeah, I saw enlist in 1939. Uh, let's see, how, how old were you? When you enlisted? I was a little over 18. A little over 18. Nice. Did any of your friends join with you? No, no. We were six of us went down to enlist. Uh -huh. And I was the only one that passed the physical. Oh, really? Well, you know, being a Roman, uh, we didn't travel very far in those days, you know. Yeah. And I was a little bit hesitant about going alone. Uh -huh. But it was the best move I ever made. The best move. Oh, yeah? Terrific education, a terrific, terrific experience. And thank God I'm, I'm here if I can get to that. Yeah. Uh, did your family object to you going? My father was a little bit hesitant because he says six years is a long time, you know, because yeah. the enlistment was for six years at the time. I said, Dad, I says, uh, there might, might have been two dozen cars on East Dominic Street at that time, you know. Yeah. I said, I might have Killed an automobile accident. I says, you never know. I says, come on. So we just now, uh, I was being interviewed by a first class torpedo man. This right. is what they did in those days. I mean, they, they investigated your neighborhood and they come into your house and talk to your family mm -hmm. and you're accepted, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, what made you choose the Navy? Uh, a friend of mine's brother was, was a sailor, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't have any trade. Oh. And I had limited education. And I thought that the Navy would be a place to, to learn a trade, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And uh, I thought that. When you go out to sea, you've got your galley there, your bakery there, your, everything is there, you know, provided you get sunk. And uh, I was never impressed by the foot soldier, mm -hmm. although uh, I honored him highly. Uh, I've seen what they've gone through, and, and I would never want to go through what the foot soldier's gone through. Yeah. The foot soldier was our heroes, believe me. Well, you guys went through a lot, too. You guys went through a lot, too. Well, that's almost 61 years now. I mean, yeah. uh, where were you first sent once you enlisted? Uh, well, first we went to Albany, got sworn in, and then we went to Newport, Rhode Island, at the Recruit State uh, uh, Center, and we had our training at, at Newport. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I stayed in Newport after I graduated from my recruit training. I stayed in Newport, uh, uh, not to my liking, but I was uh, assigned to a temporary ship's company. Mm -hmm. And that was outfitting the new recruits coming in with their uniforms and, and gear that they had to have mm -hmm. during the Navy. So I stayed there a couple, three months, and then I shipped out to the West Coast. Um, what were some of the things you did for training at at Newport? Pardon? Some of the things that you did for training? Well, you uh, you learn your knots, you learn your compass, you learn all your nautical nautical uh, uh, things that you were going to do aboard ship. Some mm -hmm. things that you knew that you might want to uh, go further in your training, you know. Uh -huh. But we did a lot of marching. Oh yeah. You know? And uh, we did marching, uh, song, throw out the barrel, and all that bit. And uh, uh, we learned, we learned discipline, discipline. That's that's one of the main things I I did learn in the Navy. Discipline myself. How long after training uh, was Pearl Harbor? Did you get sent to Pearl Harbor? Well, I left. I left Newport in the early forties. In February, March. Yep. 
and went to the uh, West Coast and got aboard the West Virginia. Now I've never been aboard a battleship. Yeah. My God, I looked at those 16 inch guns and all the any aircraft guns and, and machine guns. My God, I says anybody be foolish to attack us, you know? And, and I was awestruck, believe me. You know, broke New York. Yeah. I don't even have canoes, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, uh, I was assigned the uh, second division mm -hmm. uh, as a senior second class. And uh, I made seem in first class while I was in the second division. And then I, I requested that I be transferred to the, uh, the ship shop, uh -huh. which had materialized. And mm -hmm. I went, went to the ship shop and I'm learning the trade as a ship you know, cutting, welding, fabricating, uh, maintenance, mm -hmm. you know, metal maintenance or whatever. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. I, I never did this before, you know, and I enjoyed this. And uh, uh, lo and behold, I, uh, before December the 7th, uh, I think it was early 41, or mid 41, I made third class ship fitter. Uh -huh. okay? Do you want to just jump right into Pearl Harbor? Jump right into Pearl Harbor about what happened there? Well, on the summer of the 7th, uh, it was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. Uh -huh. uh, which Hawaii has a lot of beautiful days, but uh, I don't know why they had to give the Japs the benefit of the doubt. But, uh, uh, but it was a beautiful day for them to attack. Yeah. You know? And uh, we had breakfast. Now, uh, each each of uh, the division, the ship is uh, uh, assigned uh, certain divisions throughout the ship, uh -huh. and each division has four sections. Okay. Now, on this day, the uh, first and third section had the duty, okay. so they stay aboard. Uh, whatever the first section. Uh, is overloaded with, then the third section steps in and gives a hand, okay? Yeah. Well, it just so happened that I was in the third section, the first section had the duty, and uh, I was after breakfast, and I sit around the ship or shop on a Sunday, either write letters or read a book, or just bat the breeze, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was quite a while after breakfast that uh, a wave fire and rescue was sounded. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that is when there's a disaster on another ship or station, you send help. Mm -hmm. The fire and rescue team goes to the, uh, to the scene. Yeah. Well, I was, I was curious, you know, and uh, uh, it was close to 8 o'clock, and uh, I went topside. Just out the ship first shot to the hatchway, and I went up the ladder. And, uh, got on the weather deck, and, and I'm looking around now. In the Navy, uh, when you're on top side, you got to wear a hat, or the master of arms will send you below, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have a hat on, okay? And I was standing just outside the hatch because I figured if I seen the master of arms, I'd go down below. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on, and I'm looking around to see where, where the fire and rescue team were going, you know. Well, they hadn't deployed us yet. So, just about then, call the colors. Well, you don't run or walk or get out of the scene. You stay right there, you're standing at attention. Mm -hmm. And you don't salute without a hat, you don't salute. Okay. Uh, the Navy never saluted without a hat. Or under cover in a building, you don't salute. Yeah. Well. This was God sent. This was God sent. Had I had a hat on, now I'm standing on the port side of the ship, the attacking side. If I had a hat on, I would have been doing this. Okay? I didn't have a hat on, but in the corner of my eye, I see this low flying plane, you know, and I said, my God, at that time it was the United States Army Air Force. 
Uh, they maneuvers on a Sunday, you know, that's the first stop. And uh, I didn't see the torpedo until he dropped it. And the torpedo's coming right from our ship. And when he veered off, he strafed about, oh, maybe 15, 20, 25 feet above my head. Mm. And I knew right there, I saw the little red, yeah. people call it meatball, but I know the Italian calls that a meatball. Anyway, I saw the red insignia on his, on his plane, and uh -huh. I knew the Japs were attacking. You know. yeah. Now, the torpedo hadn't hit yet. I shot down the, uh, the ladder, our server is called a ladder in the Navy, okay? So I shot down the ladder and I had yelled into the ship for the shot. The Japs are attacking. Uh, I remember this Jimmy Cam, another ship fitter, he looked at me as if to say, you're full of, and he didn't get that last word out because I told me to hit about them. So I ran out, uh, went down to the third deck. Now the third deck is maybe uh, a deck and a half, close to two decks below the waterline. Okay. All right. Now my battle station was was almost directly at. Okay. So what you do, uh, a ship fitter is, is always assigned damage control anyway, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So what what I did is uh, I set condition what we call condition Z, and that's closing all hatches, doors, ventilators, keep the water, keep the compartment water tight. Okay. And mind you, I'm busy, you know. It's when you're not busy that you get a little frightened. Yeah. You know. So Roy Powers, I should put her second class, was in charge of the compartment mm -hmm. of our battle station. I said, what do we do, Roy? He said, I don't know. Just hang loose, he said, you know, or words to that effect. So I said, let me check with the repair party forward. Uh, I'm glad I did, because that's the last I saw of Roy Powers. Mm -hmm. I touched the door to feel for heat, that's what you do first, and then there's a brass cap, a tan of end tight. You take that off and you smell. Okay, for gas or whatever. So I says, I'm going into the main repair party. I says, it's all right. Like I said, that was the last time I saw Roy. He had just returned from the uh, state of Washington and he saw his newborn baby for the first time and the last time. Anyway, I went in there and there's a ruck, ruck there was a ship there also. Um, he also he says, Pooch, I forgot my damage control keys to the locker. He said, I gotta get in there. Well, there was this big towing cable reel. The cable was about three inches in diameter. And there was also a crank on this reel. Now I'm not I'm acting fast. I'm telling it a lot slower than I did it. And I grabbed this crank, I had a, a square knob on it about uh, four or five inches in diameter or rectangular and uh, uh, this is what you use to crank the cable out. Okay. Well I knew I couldn't break the lock on the uh, on the locker. The, the Navy locks are. Uh, anyway, uh, I attacked the hinges on the door and I did, I did successfully uh, uh, break the door open, so I pulled it over, and the first thing I did was reach in and grab a crank and toss it over to Rutger, and then I grabbed the battle lantern. And now, the crank, uh, throughout the ship, you have uh, tanks. Now, you have, uh, outside the ship, you have the 16-inch high tensile steel armor belt okay, mm -hmm. on a battleship. Okay. And that's what makes them so slow. Then you have the skin of the ship, okay? Then inside the skin of the ship, you have these tanks, and we call them voids. Well, they're actually used 
to counter flood. Okay? Alright. Now we're counter flooding the starboard side. The port side was the attacking side. Now in the meantime we're getting torpedo hits. You know? Because uh -huh. we got actually uh, six torpedoes hit my ship. Wow. You know? One five hundred pound bomb uh, came in on an ankle and it opened up the paymaster's office. Uh, maybe one or two uh, small 100 pounders. And uh, so what we did, now the ship is listing. Uh, it's listing, uh, the claim is listing about 28 degrees. Now, I have to tell you about the Oklahoma and, and why she sunk so fast. Uh, another shipmate of mine named Lou Grabinski was going over on December the 8th for annual, what they call annual military inspection. Mm -hmm. And they were going to inspect these voids, these tanks that were counter flood. So the covers were off and they oh, couldn't wow. counter flood. I know she Oklahoma. capsized real quick, like, see? Wow. Now, uh, we weren't in that situation, thank God. And uh, uh, we counter flooded. And from a 28 degree list, we brought her over to about a six or eight degrees. Now, these big lines were tied up to the Tennessee. Uh, they were stretching. They were already stretching, believe me, because the ship was going. You know. now, in the meantime, we're getting hit with torpedoes. You know, but when, I, I can't remember being disengaged because of being hit. You know, so uh, Rector was a diver. He was, some, he was a first class ship but he was a diver and a good friend of mine. And uh, he said, don't worry, Pooch, he said, we're settling on the bottom. The harbor was maybe eight, ten, maybe twelve feet at the most uh, from the bottom of the, of the uh, uh, from the keel of the ship yeah. to the bottom of the harbor it was only about ten, ten, twelve feet at the most. So we settled on the bottom. We didn't completely sink. But our compartments were pretty well filled. Yeah. And uh, then by word of mouth, our PA system was knocked out. Our electricity was knocked out. And uh, by word of mouth, we got to work to abandon ship. Well, we went topside, and this little ensign, it was in this room. And I come out, we always got hit five or six torpedoes. And uh, we called them 90 Day Wonders. He said, well, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's, what's going on? He's confused, you know. Can I swear? Yeah. Rucker says, you silly son of a bitch. He says, we're being attacked by the, by the Japanese. Oh, we are? Well, about that time, we're, me and Rucker were getting ready to go. Rucker told me, he says, Pooch, he says, Stick with me, will you? I, said, I don't want to go alone. I said, you go, Rector, you're going to go alone. <laughs> and we're laughing, you know. So, when you tie up alongside of a ship, you have what's known as, as fenders. They're, they're bamboo woven together. And they're maybe the size, a little smaller than a 30-gallon than a drum. Mm. But it's, it's all bamboo, and when you come alongside a ship, you haul those over so you don't scratch the paint. Yeah. Most ships had 12 coats of paint on them. And at that time, we didn't have uh, uh, what they call this new water paint there. It was Kemptone at one time. Now it's uh, vinyl paint or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we had oil-based paint. Uh -huh. And this printer line is tied to the top side around a cleat. So I went down that line onto the uh, 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 fender and I jumped on the 16-inch uh, armor belt. And I were tied up alongside the Tennessee. So I walked along and I jumped over to the Tennessee armor belt. And another ship footer, uh, by the name of Vester, he yells at me that he sprained his ankle. So he was a slight built guy, and I gave him my arm, and he pulled him over, and we went all the way down to the, the, uh, the side of the ship on the armor belt, and uh, we're going down, we're going up to Jacob's Ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the ticket letter is uh, metal rungs welded to the side of the ship. Right. Anyway, I'm going up to Jacob Dunn, and I knew this gunner's mate. Uh, he must have gone 240, 250. I'm going up there so fast, he's stepping on my hands. I kept going, I kept going. Uh, there was no pain, you know. Yeah. And the foolish thing that I did was look up in the air. A lot of bombs coming down. I'll show you how many bombs came down. I got a, I got a computer readout, and uh, I said, "Those bastards are trying to kill me." Like, you know, those bombs looked like they were aiming at me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my first curious moment of the whole episode. When I got aboard the Tennessee and uh, reported to damage control officers just surround. So we sat down there until after the attack. Uh, many, many of our men were, were coming in. One guy had, his leg was burnt, and I could see the white bone. Oh, wow. Because his skin, he must have caught it someplace. It just flopped over, you know. And, and he, I'm sitting down on a deck there, and, and his leg was just oh. past my face, you know. Anyway. We were told to go in and muster in at the uh, administration building on, on Fort Allen, which is a Navy air base. Okay. And, you know, I've always wondered, I've always wondered, and I can't, all these, all these years, from the time I went to the administration building to the time that I took a ferry across the, the main part of the island, I don't know what kind of time lapsed in there. I don't know where it went because uh, here it was uh, morning that I went to the ad building and we're going across the ferry at nighttime. Well, I, got, I think I got a picture of it. The flames of the Arizona were behind us. Uh, I don't know if there's a picture or not of the way they battleship rollers lined up, but the battleship Arizona was directly behind the Tennessee, and we were tied up alongside the Tennessee. There was a, uh, a repair ship uh, tied up alongside the, uh, the Arizona, and, and uh, uh, maybe you've heard it, that there's still oil seeping up yeah, I did. from the Arizona, and you know, some say it's Service crime. Don't follow. Anyway, uh, we're going across the channel, and uh, I happen to look over the gunwale of the uh, of the ferry, and I could see the flames of the Arizona, where the background of the West Virginia flag, still flying. What a sorry, what a hurt feeling that was. Uh, you know, I, I always knew that we could beat anybody. That's the way I felt. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, the Japs did us a favor by knocking out the battleships because uh, when I first went in, it was always said that the battleship was the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. Now, the Japanese taught us that that airplane and the aircraft carrier is your first line of defense. Well, Halsley was told, stay out to sea. He played Captain Miles, hiding and all that bit. So were the other carriers, which is good. We had very little fleet. Uh, I know one. one Pearl Harbor survivor, he was on the uh, USS Patterson, a destroyer. Uh -huh. They did get out of the harbor. Well, I, I tell him, I said, Lou, I said, uh, what were you going to do with the Japanese fleet? I mean, as soon as they saw you, they'd probably blow you out of the water. Yeah, he said, but the skipper wanted to get out of the channel, you know. I said, thank God, I says, they weren't too close. They were by 
maybe 250 miles away, you know. Yeah. But there was a brave thing of that skipper, a brave thing of that skipper. Now this, these, I think we, I think we uh, captured or sunk three or four uh, uh, two-man submarines. Now, uh, I think I was shipper first or second class at the time, and we had one of these submarines mounted on, on some quays, like, okay, and they asked me to cut it in half. Well, you know, I'm thinking, those monkeys probably put their little booby trap in there, and I just, for me, waiting for me, you know. So I'm cutting and shaking and all, and, and we finally got the submarine apart. Now you, you probably don't remember, you probably have seen them, but there were clear glass light bulbs, okay, and they had a point on the end. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that kind of bulb? I they don't make them anymore, really. But we screwed them off and looked at it. Made in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's what I wanted to burn that submarine, you know. But we went to the receiving station, they gave us a mattress, and this, there was an arena just outside the gate of Pearl Harbor that we had, uh, you know, smokers like boxing matches and uh, show people coming in and And there And was, there was a boxing ring in the middle, you know, and long steps. And they told us to sack out. So I was tired. I was tired. Not not so much that I did so much, but it tires you out, yeah. you know. And uh, Robert Adams, he was just out of he lived just outside of Binghamton. He was like a big brother to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was second class, a first class chauffeur. And um, he says, let's sock out Pooch. So he, he got him one step, I got another step, and we laid down. I was just ready to doze off. My division officer comes in with a flashlight. Not, matter of fact, we had dock and ship at the time, but he had the flashlight so he could see where he was walking. And then he goes over and he says, uh, I need volunteers, he says, to go back to the West Virginia to fight fire. He says, the Arizona oil is burning and it's floating up towards West Virginia. He was on the ball. He was a good man. Mm -hmm. I met him in the state of West Virginia at a reunion, by the way. And uh, Adam says, Pooch, don't volunteer. Well, I was a young kid and I was gung ho. I was going to volunteer. Yeah. And uh, but Adam saw me, he says, don't volunteer. So I didn't, you know. So he asked a couple more times for volunteers. So okay, I'll assign. That's Fred White. He had shoes about that big. We used to call them snowshoes. And uh, he says, Puccio Adams, front and center. <laughs> well, I don't know whether he heard us or whatever. So I guess so. So he says, Barger Motor Launch at Fleet Landing, he says, and uh, uh, head for the West Virginia. Yes, sir. And I didn't salute him around because I didn't have a hat. All I had was shorts and a t shirt and nothing, sneakers or shoes. So we go over to the uh, Fleet Landing, we catch a motor launch, and we're going across the channel. Now, they had an armed guard on the capsized Oklahoma, mm -hmm. uh, because there were still men trapped in there, you know. And as we're coming across the channel, and we're in the open channel now, uh, this armed guard starts firing at us. I could have been the first sailor killed by friendly fire, you know. So when I heard the zing, 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 and you know, the, uh, the blast from the from the, uh, the rifle. I knew this guy was firing at us, you know. So I'm ducking down and popping up and yelling, "Boat ahoy, West Virginia!" Boy, they must have heard me in San Francisco. I was yelling so much, you know. 
And uh, finally, he either ran out of ammunition or heard us, you know, and we went in. And we fought fire that night. We got aboard to West Virginia. Uh, I, I first, uh, first went into the executive officers to hose down some of the records. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went aft and uh, we hosed down the oil that was floating up. Now, there were, uh, I heard during the attack, uh, the president of the Pearl Harbor Survival Association, uh, he was stationed on Fort Allen because his ship was out to sea, but he was in aviation, and he was pulling a lot of guys out of the, uh, out of the harbor mm -hmm. full of oil and burning, oil burning, and uh, he, uh, he told me that he, he pulled out quite a few guys I mean, from the West Virginia, you know. And uh, I stayed aboard the West Virginia for salvage duty for about a week. Mm -hmm. And then I was called over to the submarine base for temporary duty. Mm -hmm. Went back to the West Virginia for more salvaging work. Now we removed uh, an aircraft guns and put them on shore batteries. All right. Okay. The Army would take over from there. And after that, we were called back to the submarine base again. Because, you know, that, that's all we had. We had the submarine fleet. I mean, they were, they were intact. They were never hurt. And uh, I was called to the submarine base. And uh, I was made ship's company, permanent duty. Well, while I was there for a year or so, uh, I kept putting in chits for transfer to West Virginia because she was going back to the States. Yeah. And you know, I figured stateside duty, you know, get some leave, go see the folks. Yeah. Nope. I was froze. I was frozen. I was finally told, you're froze here, Pucci. I said, I won't let you go. It's like, you know, this is uh, Commander Eddie. He was an engineering officer. Uh, but I did put more chits in. As a matter of fact, I went in in any ship or station. And he called me and bought me out. He says, well, You're not going anyplace, so forget it. And, uh, but I did manage in 1944, I did manage to uh, uh, get 30 days leave. Right. And uh, the only way they could let me go on leave was to give me emergency leave. They gave me regular leave. I'd have to be reassigned. Uh, and like I said, this engineering officers didn't want to lose any of his men. Yeah. And by then I was chief petty officer. I uh, was second class, first class, and a chief petty officer. And I, I loved the navy. I loved the navy really. I was only in there eight years. Mm, then I got married, and I figured out no, it's no life for a married man. Yeah. Because we were out to sea five, six months all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the story of if you ever buy, if you want to know what went on and why it went on, get this book. Get this book. It's not maybe fourteen, fifteen dollars. Barnes and Noble has it. Now then, one myth I want you to do. Last, a year ago, how was it? Yeah, last May, uh, Chip Haley called me up. Mm -hmm. It was about May 23rd, 24th. She says, Celsius says, I'm going to send you two tickets for the Pearl Harbor movie. And you and your girlfriend can go. And, uh, but I want you to call me up Saturday morning as early as possible and give me your opinion. That's what she wrote on me. Give me almost a half a page. Wow. The Pearl Harbor movie was, was a farce, it was a joke. There were only That's West Virginia. You get that all right? And 
this is when she was refitted and back out to sea. She was in four engagements. She sailed into Tokyo Harbor and she was called a ghost ship. How long did uh, it take to repair the USS West Virginia? I don't remember now. Uh -huh. I can't recall the dates. All right, now. There were three things in the Pearl Harbor movie that were true, okay? Uh -huh. uh, one was, one was our bugler, a bugler by the name of Dick Fisk, a friend of mine. I've seen him at almost every reunion I went to. Dick Fisk, Fisk play taps, okay, for the movie when they showed the coffin of my skipper, Captain Benyon. Uh -huh. Did you see the movie? Yeah. All uh, right, they showed the coffin, there's a wooden box, and then on the name was Captain Benyon. Uh -huh. Dick Fisk, he played taps uh -huh. for that movie, okay? Now then, I'm proud of this picture because it. Doria Miller was played by Cuba Gooding. Yeah. Okay? Cuba Gooding's a little yeah. guy, you know, but Doria Miller was about 6'5, six, 6'4. Six, and uh, he was a boxer, he was a wrestler, he was a weightlifter. Uh, at that time, uh, it was segregation. Truman desegregated the Navy and the Army and the Air Force and all, which I'm glad he did. And quite a few years ago, a teacher at, uh, at the RFB or one of those schools, my, my, my daughter is a secretary at one of those schools, and uh, she was pasting this, this article about Doria Miller. On the, uh, on the building board. And my daughter uh, has got a good memory. Uh, saw it, and she says, My father knew that man. You know? They named the school, they named streets after him. And he was killed. He was killed uh, uh, during the Pacific engagement. I, I forgot which one. Now, if you want to make copies of this, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, these are all the torpedoes that were, were, were launched, and these are all the bombs that, that they dropped. Okay? Now, there were actually nine torpedoes launched at my ship. And six hit? So. Three of them went in the mud. Uh -huh. That's a shallow that the harbor was. Uh -huh. uh, Maybe we got a picture of Marion. I met, I met the author that put out this book. Here's a guy that, here's a guy that brought the ship back from Pearl Harbor. Right there. Yeah, and I met him in West Virginia. Uh, I want to show you a picture of how the ship was actually opened up. Those are the structure that it caused. So they just went down just a little bit below the, uh, well, the armor belt tapers as it goes down, okay? And I think that's about where they, they hit us, where it was not 16 inches in, in, uh, in width or in thickness. Peter would have to go up and we would shut her down. You know? uh, 
after the war, uh, I came to the East Coast and well, I had I had duty at Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, now I went aboard the USS Little Rock. And here we are back in forty first part of forty six, me and three other chiefs. And now the USS Little Rock is in Buffalo, New York. So I went there, uh, uh, when did I go there? Ninety-six. I got my foot on the crater that I was sitting on. Oh, yeah. But they, they had a lot of uh, paraphernalia that I didn't agree with. They had a lot of uniforms of Korean War and whatever. Now here's a uh, General Surgeon. He's a local boy. He was keynote speaker at the uh, uh, Great American Day at, uh, at the Moran Post last year. Now, these two tomatoes, the old one was a wave from World War II. The younger one is her daughter. She's a retired Chief Petty Officer in the Navy. And we're going to meet them uh, uh, Monday in Frankfurt. There's a guy I hadn't seen since summer of '41, and I met him three years ago in San Antonio, Texas. Jim, Jimmy Cam, he's the one that was going to get full of, you know. Oh. You can't believe it. I think I got one here with big fist. Oh, yeah. There's Dick Fisk right here, the bugler. Oh, yeah. He's the one that gave me those uh, computer readouts on the bombing and the torpedo. Oh. And he goes, he goes to every, every reunion now. Uh, the last time I met him was uh, uh, in Virginia Beach. Now, I'm, I'm secretary to the Pearl Harbor Survivors Chapter 7 of Central New York here. I'm a steel worker. I didn't know anything about secretary of work, you know. And, and I put out a newsletter uh, every month for 10 months of the year. And, uh, you know, I, I work with blueprints, smoke, swore. I didn't know anything about secretary of work. But I've been told that I do a pretty good job. So, Lo and behold here, you, you, you probably don't remember this, but when the war ended, when the war ended, let's see, that date was uh, coming down. The war in Japan or the... Uh, it was August 14th, 1945, that this picture was taken. And it was on Life magazine. Okay. Now, this guy here is a retired NYPD. Okay. And they finally found him, or he knew it all the time. And he lived in Florida, and his daughter called him up. I says, Dad, would you come up? She says, I got a worthy cause. She says, I want to make some money. Uh, and, uh, We'll get your picture of, of that uh, August 14th kiss on Broadway, and we'll give it to the people if they'll donate. And my son heard this, and she lives in Woodstock, and so does my son John. And uh, John decided to go, and uh, he got this picture for me, autographed. He said, to CPO sell. Best versus Carl Muscarello. 
And I'm surprised he still puts in his blues. That's a man right here kissing that girl there. Oh, wow. That was, that was widespread. I mean, it's got to be quite a scene there. Do you remember where were you where you were at the end of the war? Uh, August 45. I was probably stationed in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh -huh. Yeah. What'd you guys do to celebrate? What'd you guys do to celebrate the victory? That I don't remember. Uh -huh. That I don't remember. Now, if you click on Washington C. Navy Memorial. This is what you would come up with first. Uh, there's a Navy Memorial, Lone Sailor Memorial. But now uh, my son entered a picture of me, and this is what you would come up with. You know, uh, when, when we went there in ninety. 96, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, and they found out I was a chief petty officer. They made me ring a bell. No big deal. Uh, ring a bell? <laughs> you know? Come on. And uh, I forgot what I told the guy. He says, and you'll be able to sit in and watch our present Navy. Well, I said, I'd like that. I like that. Uh, I can, you know, I'm always flicking on, on the History Channel every time. And uh, uh, I've got a little story to tell you about that. But uh, it showed the movie, Border of Crop Carriers, and it had that surround sound. Oh, yeah. oh, even your seats would vibrate, you know. And it was fantastic, fantastic. Uh, my son, talked me into buying a DVD, uh -huh. and uh, I'm glad I did. And I was down in Georgia, and uh, uh, went to Circuit City, and I didn't want to buy it because I didn't want to take it aboard a plane, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they sent it, they they, uh, they faxed it into uh, New Hartford, mm -hmm. and when I came back, I picked it up in Hartford, you know. And I get that surround sound. I get that sort of beautiful. Yeah. As my first mate, ship every second class. Notice that arm sticking out there? That arm was heavy, boy. Yeah. Now, uh, 1990, the Secretary of the Navy invited us to. Uh, Kings Bay, Georgia. They commissioned a submarine called the USS West Virginia. Uh, and, and we thought it was a good idea if all the Navy sailors were there. Uh, there was something I was thinking of telling you. You mentioned about uh, Sam Charlop in your. Sonny Charlotte? Yeah, what, who's that all about? Well, I never knew he was a Jew. I was never anti-Semitic. Uh -huh. And I loved him. Mm -hmm. Where'd you see that? Uh, in, the, in the script you sent us, you mentioned about Sam Charlotte. Sam Charlotte taught me the steel business. Fine. Short, stocky guy. Uh, he used to blow me out. He was first class, and I was third class when we first met. I first met Sam. Uh, it was one night on a submarine. We were we were removing these uh, long barrel uh, five inch guns on deck. Okay, they had one forward and one aft. Well, we had to drill larger holes, and it was. Uh, an impact drill uh, that I had to guide, okay? Now the, the drill hole was two inches at least. And any time 
uh, what we called an old man. Uh, there's there's a, a line here, and then across the line uh, was a board, and here was the drill, and a guy would press on it, you know. Well, sometime he would press too much, okay? And my drill would bind, and, and I'm sitting down on the deck there, you know, and I would carry my butt right across the deck, you know. And, and uh, Sam was in Charles' job, I didn't know him. And uh, come on, he says, kid, he says, don't be afraid of it. I says, I ain't afraid of nothing, you know. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, he chose me as a, as a striker, and uh, whenever he, uh, uh, whenever he uh, had to get a job done, he'd call Puccio, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, Admiral Layton died as Admiral Layton. Uh, I knew him when he was a lieutenant. Now, there were eight piers on the submarine base where the submarines came in. And uh, Pier 8 is where our shipper shop was. It was also the open pier from the channel coming in where the submarines after patrol would tie up, okay? And Admiral Nimitz and at that time Lieutenant Layton would come down and debrief the skippers, okay? And most of the time the submarines would come in with, with a broom tied to their periscope and a clean sweep. Uh, Admiral Layton, Layton wrote this book and I was there. Now, you know we broke the Japanese code. Yeah. Admiral Layton, Layton was Nemesis code. Well, he was also uh, Admiral Kimmel, Kimmel's code officer, you know? And their office was a stone throw from, from our shipper shop. And you know, we'd see him occasionally. I mean, he'd come down with, with, the, with Nimitz. Nimitz was, was a terrific strategist, mm -hmm. terrific, better than uh, uh, MacArthur. Matter of fact, in one of my books, uh, uh, Harry Truman called MacArthur a, a coward because he left Bataan, you know, on a PT boat. Now this, this book here, and all the research I've done, all the research I've done, this book here tells it all. He's on the internet, he's on the internet, if you want to come up with, uh, if you want to print up about 18, 20 pages, mm -hmm. but, but the book, I don't know, it's $14, $15, Barnes and Noble, uh, I recommend it highly. Uh, I got oodles and oodles of books. Uh, about I got a couple, three hundred dollars worth of books just, just on the conspiracy, you know what I mean? And like I said, I put 18, eight years in the Navy, mm -hmm. enjoyed them all, and I thank God for the Navy, and uh, it gave me an education that really rounded me out. Yeah. Uh, I was. Uh, I left school in first year high, okay? Because we're just coming out of a depression and, and the jobs aren't trickling down too fast here now, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, we didn't have any malls or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the pool rooms. Well, people said a guy hangs around a pool room is a bum. But my father used to call me a bum. I couldn't, get away, I couldn't wait to get away from them. And uh, six of us decided to go to Utica and join the Navy. Uh, the other five failed. Uh, uh, one went in the Air Force, two went in the Army, uh, three went in the Army. Then one, when the war broke out, joined the Navy. Uh, and uh, uh, he came to see me. I was on a submarine base. He was on the USS Washington, a new battleship. And uh, I grew up with a guy, you know. 
That's a sad story. Do you uh, keep in contact with many of the? When I go, when I go to the reunions, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was this Jimmy Cam, I mean, I kept in contact with him for a while, but uh, come on, there. I'm pushing 82, and I'm one of the younger ones, okay? In February, I'll be 82. But uh, now, I was looking at some of the pictures of Pearl Harbor survivors. We used to have 24 and 26 members. Now we're down 16, 18. Some can't make it, some pass away. And, uh, one thing, the World Trade Center. Our motto is, remember Pearl Harbor and keep America alert, okay? Well, anybody that was there will always remember Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Keep America alert, we can't do it. For the simple reason, our bylaws, we have, we have a, a, an article in there, uh, I can't remember the number, but it states, you will not discuss any secretary or political matters at a convention or a meeting. Well, I'm trying, I'm, for the last three years, I've been trying to rescind this bylaw, okay? And the last time, on well, the first time I tried, uh, I had angioplasty down the gut, wayside. And uh, I tried to do it this year. We were 18 days late because for three months we didn't have a meeting and I had to have the, the unanimous vote of the membership uh, to pursue this uh, rescinding of the bylaw, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're 18 days late and we couldn't do it. But in 2003, I'm going to try again. Because, uh, you know, I took the oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, both domestic and, and, and foreign, okay? Now here's a military organization, of all the military organizations, that's what we are, telling me I don't have any right to the First Amendment. In other words, they're taking away my, first, my, my freedom of speech. Now, I, mean, if I can't talk about something. Now I wrote, I wrote in, my, in my brief to the uh, uh, bylaw committee there that uh, could we avert it, the World Trade Center, if we had spoken out? Well, I hate to go on an investigation on a World Trade Center fiasco, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but the United States is hated almost throughout the world. Almost throughout the world I hated. I remember a few years, well maybe five or ten years after I got out of service, we saved quite a few countries from communist takeover. I remember a picture, I can still see it now. This one monkey had a sign, Yankee go home. Now come on, we just, we just stopped the communists from taking over your country. We lost men. You're telling you I can go home. Now we got not only not only Iran and Iraq, we got Korea. You know? mm -hmm. China, our most favorite nation. Why do they have missiles aimed at us? Can you tell me why? I don't know. I don't know. It's a funny world, a funny world. Uh, well, this guy's coming pretty soon. Is there, we're going to have to wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to add? Do we're we? going to have to meet that senator. It's Who? the senator, Meyer. Oh. So we're going to have to wrap up pretty soon. Is there anything an hour. you'd really like to add? Uh, like any other stories or information or anything? I can. Would you like, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close? Now, Tom did a good job with my taxes. Tell him.
Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see them uh, uh, increase the benefits to the uh, uh, disabled workers. I'm one of them. Not a big deal. I'll take all of him.